Greetings, everyone. We are moving along here. We are now starting chapter three of Search for Nonviolent Future, page 60. We're going to have to start planning our champagne party when we get to the end of the book and decide what to do next. But uh, I start this chapter with an anecdote which happened in the life of my spiritual teacher, Eknath Ishwaran, when he was still back in India where he and a friend of his saw a caged bear. And you can come across these scenes in India today uh, where bears or monkeys are mistreated. And the friend was furious and he said he was going to go home and get his gun. And uh, Ishrin kind of, although he hadn't really started meditating yet, he was still instinctively feeling that shooting a person to save a bear was not the right equation. So he said, wait a minute, let's see what I can do. And he talked to the man and found out that he didn't want to keep this bear in a small cage, but he couldn't afford a larger one. Long story, <coughs> long story short, he managed to get a carpenter to build a bigger cage. The zookeeper, or whatever you want to call that person, was happy. The bear was happy. His friend was happy. All the people seeing this animal, consciously or unconsciously, were happier. And I present this as a classic example of how nonviolence is sometimes what an African-American activist recently called a way out of no way. We tend to see situations, dilemmas, in terms of fight or flight. Both of them are traps. Nonviolence is neither fight in the sense that you are not reflecting the suffering back on the opponent. They are not flight in the sense you're not complying with their unjust request. You are not even complying with their implicit emotional demand that you fear them or get angry at them, which sometimes feeds into their cycle. It's just what they want. So between your emotional flight from the situation or you're fighting back is the way of creative nonviolence. And now to talk about what is the dynamic there? What is the driving force? There uh, turns out that both Gandhi and King were very articulate on this point. Uh, you will remember that Gandhi said, I have learned through bitter experience, the one supreme example to conserve my anger and just as steam conserved can be turned into energy, so anger conserved can be turned into a force to change the world. Likewise, and I don't know whether he read this or not uh, in Gandhi, but Martin Luther King was challenged one time that his movement had caused a lot of anger. We'll, we'll talk about that at some point. He actually unleashed some frustration. But he said, we did not lead to outbursts of anger. We harnessed, this is the key language here. We harnessed anger under discipline for maximum effect. And that's the idea I would like to share with all of us who are frustrated and, and unhappy with the innumerable injustices in our world. The question we have to face in ourselves is very often, what am I going to do about this? Am I going to try to express my frustration or am I going to try to change the problem? I can express my frustration by beating up on the other person or by going out and holding a protest. And in a funny way, I'm classifying that as not really the nonviolent response. The nonviolent response is going to say, what's the cause of this situation? What is my leverage to do something about it? In the long course of uh, search for a nonviolent future, that is what we are leading up to. We're exploring the dynamic to situate ourselves so we can comfortably understand the forces that we're dealing with and then talk about the institutions that are forming uh, conduits, channels for this force. That's what I invite you to join me for at our next discussions. Thanks very much.